Um, okay, what are we doing? We're talking week 10. We're talking week 10. So for those of you who have paid any attention to what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks, we have been teasing this weekend. Yes. Uh, we are doing this from parts unknown, i.e. somewhere near Ann Arbor, somewhere near the Detroit airport at present. Mm-hmm. We do not have strong enough internet to do our normal <laughs> midnight stream though we tried it was just not going to happen right so alas we're recording this on an iphone we've got a portable recording set up here and we will do our best to get this out as soon as possible so apologies to those of you who are out there who listen for the midnight live stream or waiting for the midnight live stream. it's still a show still show it's still a show it's in audio form and in video form the timing's a little bit different we could have been partying with the youths in ann arbor but we got cheap pizza, a hotel room, game still going for you. For you. This is what we do for the Verbal Yes. Hood. So, yeah, this, I think, goes without saying that it will not be a normal show. Um, though we paid attention to and though we have a pretty good sense for the themes of the day, Dan. Yes. We didn't get to watch our normal amount of college football. So Still, too- like, decent amount? Decent amount, but I think just to preserve, like, yeah, 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 honesty... Yeah. This is a show about honesty, first and foremost. That's true. We're going to make sure that this is uh, not the normal show and more of just a express reaction I agree. version to what we saw. We, I think, have a pretty good sense for what happened in the early block and the mid-afternoon block. It's just the night games that are going on right now. And, you know, because we were in the press box for a good chunk of the day, mm-hmm. brag much. Yeah, such a cool thing. We did not get to watch our normal amount of football. So uh, we'll get to doodle alerts. We'll get to reverbs. We'll get to all the normal bits on the Tuesday Spillover episode. We'll use that as sort of a second recap episode. Yeah. Uh, but as for today, today is about what we kind of took in here. Yes. What we saw around college football. Skin tight Saturday. Um, I had a nice little week pick in time, not going to lie. I don't know what's going to happen with all the night games, and this is going to be especially weird to listen to after the fact, where you're like, well, South Carolina is pretty impressive, and then they lose by 30, right? But there is something fun about being in the moment with this, and it's a great opportunity for anybody listening to say, yeah, you probably didn't watch a ton of Syracuse, Virginia Tech. Here's what happened to file away for next week. Yeah, it's great. That, that's exactly right. So um, make sure you hit follow. Make sure you hit subscribe. Yeah. Make sure you vote in our Baller Top 12 poll. By the way, I have opened it up to everybody who signs up for our Patreon. So it's not just people with the paid tiers. If you go to verballers.com, there's a free tier. Yes. If you don't feel like paying, we get it. It's cool. But this week, this week only, you're going to have the opportunity to vote in our Baller Top 12 poll. That's going to drop bright and early on Sunday morning. So let's get more people in the tent, get more opinions out there. Um, let's start with Penn State, Ohio State. Let's though. start with Penn State, Ohio State. Penn State, Ohio State. We were roaming tailgates today, doing our best to try and find televisions. We watched the fourth quarter of this game or a chunk of the fourth quarter of this game from our seats up in the press box. Your final score was 22-13 Ohio State. It was not a game dominated by def- or by offense, excuse me, much more so by defense. At one point in the game, I turned to you when we were watching and we compared the team box scores and the team stat lines. Right. And they look shockingly similar. Mm-hmm. So this was very similar, frustratingly so, to other Ohio State, Penn State games that we have seen. And I can speak to it from the Penn State perspective. Right. But um, to the extent that we watched this game and were able to take it in, what did you get from what you saw out of uh, Ohio State? So Ohio State seemed to make a lot very difficult for Penn State. Defensively, it seemed like they were overwhelming Penn State's offensive line a good amount. Obviously, highlighted by the defensive stand, first, second, third, fourth, and goal. Probably highlighted by Penn State's decision to run it straight up the gut, first, second, third down, before attempting to throw it into a real solid amount of traffic out of the shotgun on fourth and goal. But from Ohio State, it felt like they were generating, even though they weren't finishing drives, even though they weren't hitting a number of downfield passes like they have earlier on in the season, which, of course, they weren't. It's the Penn State defense, right? Right. Uh, That they were finding ways to get Brandon Innes, Jeremiah Smith, Quinshawn Judkins, a little bit of wiggle room, a little bit of space, whether it was play design, whether it was... uh, reading what the defense was giving to them. And Will Howard was very sloppy early on. Will Howard was giving the defense. I mean, he gave Penn State its only touchdown in this game on the first drive 
of the game for Ohio State. It jumped a slant, mm-hmm. took it to the house. It was up. The Penn State was up ten nothing before we even knew what happened. Right. Um, but it was from that point forward that Ohio State started to kind of assert itself a little bit more. And you know, you can speak to what they did on offense, but what they did on defense, I think, was especially impressive. Yeah. Penn State had two drives inside the five yard line, came away with zero points. Yep. They scored exactly your favorite stat, zero offensive touchdowns just had to those two field goals and really this is the second year of scoring zero offensive touchdowns it was 29 seconds down two scores last year when That's they exactly got in the right. end zone yeah and i think the the bigger theme for me was just the way that ohio state bullied penn state really on both sides yeah you know i mean we had some questions about the left side of the ohio state line rightfully so there were some you know newer guys that were starting on that side mm-hmm. um, or less experienced guys at a minimum and the fact that they had as much success as they did, I think, as an offensive line unit was pretty impressive. Quinchon Judkins, close to 100 yards rushing. Yep. Trey, uh, Trevion Henderson, f- over 50 yards rushing, like 54 yards. Will Howard did not have an eye-popping stat line with respect to what he did on the ground, but he did have two really big third-down conversions late in the game that extended yes. their drive and essentially put the game on ice. So I, it felt like, to your point, it came together late for them in some respect, on offense, but ultimately that it was enough to put the game on ice. The Penn State side of this, I think, is really frustrating. I agree, yeah. Because it feels like the same game every year. Mm-hmm. It does look so, okay. It's the same game every year. Zoom out for a moment. We talked a little bit about Penn State not recently finding the next, I guess it would be Parker Washington would be the last guy in this respect. They found the tight ends. We, we talked about not finding the receivers. Penn State is not finding the quarterbacks and offensive coordinators and offensive linemen at the same time, right? I, I, there is something – I think Andy Kotelnicki is probably really good. Is he – you have four plays to get in the end zone from the three-yard line good? Early returns are no, not for Penn State, not good enough. And so maybe it's an execution thing. It wasn't a creativity thing. To no, me, well, he I wasn't mean, creative enough there, it seemed. Th- there were several drives in this game where I thought they were going to go all trick play all the time. Yeah. Right. Whether it's using Tyler Warren, whether it's using creative sets, whether, I mean, you name it. I mean, they, it felt like they were emptying the clip against Ohio State with respect to creativity. Mm-hmm. Creativity and, is not the issue, it's scoring points. Okay. So Drew Aller's injured. He's playing on kind of one leg or one knee or whatever. Looked good. Look pretty good, but was scrambling early for for key first downs, and it's different after playing you know three and a half quarters against Ohio State. Your body wears down. I assume so. I I think my body would wear down. So the to me the thing with Penn State is everything looked like they had to scratch and claw. Not everything. Eighty five percent of their successful plays seem like tight windows. Had to break three tackles to get to seven yards. Right. Everything seemed a little bit easier. Maybe it's because they had better skill position. Ohio State. But the Penn State scratch and claw element to me was a little bit disappointing that it's another year of this. Well, look, Ben Jones, our friend who writes about Penn State, has been on the show. Mm -hmm. He threw this one out on Twitter. He says, in the last two Ohio State games, Penn State has thrown the ball 63 times and Mm -hmm. completed 13 of those passes, just 13 of those passes to wide receivers. Quote, you can point to a ton of other things, but the wideout play and development simply hasn't been good enough. Right. This is not a trade secret at no. this point. We we know this about Penn State. And I think the frustration was palpable in the immediate aftermath of this game. Zach Seiko, who does the Locked on Nittany Lions podcast, shout out to him. Mm-hmm. He tweeted out, still in shock from what I witnessed post game for Penn State versus Ohio State. The student section booed the team as they lined up for the alma mater. Then half the team walked into the tunnel before the song was over. So Man. the team feeling it, the crowd feeling it, it, you know, it sucks to kind of lay that on the players. Obviously, there is frustration abound. Mm-hmm. James Franklin took on some of that in his post game press conference, saying, you know, he's got to own, oh, he's got to look in the mirror. It's entirely on him, that type of thing. Right. Look, I feel like we've heard this a million times. He's one in 10 against Ohio State at this point. Right. So there's got to be a lot of splain in this week. As for where they go from here and how they can try and take a step forward, this is still a playoff team. I think for the most part, this is a playoff team. I Technically, yes. Technically, yes. Um, I don't know if it was all that inspiring a performance, though. Right. And that's probably the bigger question. Can they get into the playoff with an 11-1 and record? They're not going to make the Big Ten title at this game. Right. At, at this rate. 
Can they make the playoff? Yeah, they can make the playoff. I think it's probable they will make the playoff. What they do when they get there, can they be a serious contender? Based on what we saw in this game, the answer is a definitive no. Well, here, here's the other thing, too. If you're going to look at the other side of this coin, it's Ohio State has a decent to, I think, good shot at winning the Big Ten. Yeah. And Penn State is a score worse than Ohio State in this moment without putting the ball in on offense. That you simulate this game 100 times, Penn State's probably scoring an offensive touchdown a number of those times. So you're saying a down, if not horrendous, all things considered, offensive performance from Penn State has them in a position to beat a probable excellent team. It's a You really have to squint to see the silver lining if you're a Penn State fan, but there's that, I guess. Well, there, there is that, and I just... I think the thing, the other thing that makes this frustrating, separate from the fact that all of these games feel the same. If I were in the home studio, I'd be yelling about this. Right. They had their chances, Dan. They had. That's the opportunity thing. Yeah. They had their chances. This was like they did not play well on offense. Ohio State certainly got the best of them on offense, but they had well, plenty of chances. They had plenty of chances to get into this game to straight up win this game because mm-hmm. their defense. All things considered, you hold yeah. Ohio State to 20 points, that should be good enough for and you, a good offense. You put the pressure on Will Howard like they put pressure on him, right? And that you're getting in his head early with that pick six, and you are, you're doing plenty to win this game, yeah. the Penn State defense-wise. Like, Ohio State had plays, of course. They're going to make plays against everybody. But there is something, like, even the threat of a big play receiver opens things up against a defense as good as Ohio State's can be. And when you don't have that like gravitational safeties no. peaking over here, it just it gives Drew Aller less to work with. It gives the, the running backs less to work with. It gives Kotil Nicky less to work with. Kotil Nicky. And there, there's that glaring issue right now that if each of those offensive position units is, you know, the part of the a slice of the offensive pie, they're they're missing a pretty significant slice. It's very frustrating. And I saw a lot of people who commented in re- in response to some of our tweets. Um, we send out the nightly tweet on Saturdays asking, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm a Penn State fan and this is how I'm feeling. And there were a couple of people who chimed in and said that this should be it for Franklin. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. Right. The perspective is getting a little bit easier to justify, though. Well, you just, if you're selling hope, when you're one in 10 against what you perceive to be the most consistently difficult team in your conference. And you look at your standard as conference championship level, but you've lost 10 of 11 at this point, you know, James Franklin is probably not going to often start winning this game. It's incredibly frustrating. It is a good road win for Ohio state. Excellent. A really good road win. It doesn't always need to be pretty. They found a way to get it done, so kudos to them. It the, does need to be at night. Conversation for another day. Conversation <laughs> for another day. Maybe we could talk about that on Tuesday. Sure. Uh, game day was not shy about the innuendo. Mm-hmm. I saw that in the why beginning. the game needs to be at night or should mm-hmm. be at night. The Penn State student body certainly was not shy about expressing its dismay over the right. decision by Fox to make this the big noon game. Um, I think it sucks. I think it should have been at night. But that being said, I don't know if the game's any different if it's at night. Likely not. Right. This it, we've got ten previous games of data to show us that this game would would probably have ended up exactly the same way. Agree. What else stood out to you? Um, we had a couple things go down. It was a drama filled day. It really was. We had obviously the game we were at, Oregon, Michigan. We had two teams in the Big Twelve lose. Big Big Twelve teams, yeah. Kansas State and Iowa State, which is certainly going to shake up that conference race. Maybe how we think about it's good for Colorado, I believe. Really good for Colorado. How yeah. those how those teams kind of factor into the larger national discussion. We had some interesting bits here in the SEC. The Georgia game, I think, left some questions Man. about where they stand in the pecking order. They won by fourteen over Florida, but. Carson Beck had a really rough go of things. Um, yeah. DJ Lagway went down for Florida. Oh, it was, saw that. It was a situation truly on the Florida side. I think they lost four guys, three of which were defensive backs in this football game. So it was a war of attrition in one sense. Georgia gets the W, but now with some of their games coming up, I think it's fair to ask questions about 
what happens to them next. As we are recording this much earlier than usual, yeah. Texas A&M, Tennessee, both on the ropes. We will not be covering that because we cannot cover do you, that. Do you have a, a current score for me? I can I can pull up the current scores as we're going through this. And yeah. by the way, just while you're pulling them up, adds an interesting wrinkle to the Billy Napier month and a half ahead of us because the narrative, the story was like, he's got to look pretty good to like very good in this stretch of impossible games that Florida has coming up. Now, DJ Lagway looks like he's out for the year. Significant hamstring injury. That was the initial. By the way, sometimes you might hear planes flying overhead. They're like flying, we're playing like 800 feet above. Yeah, our like head. we're playing in the 1993 U.S. Open <laughs> in Queens. Um, yeah, this is the the true Stefan Edberg of the college football <laughs> podcasting world right here. Um, that Billy Napier has to win games. That Billy Napier has to look good. That Billy Napier has to prove that Florida is heading in an impressive direction. Aiden Gardner is not the pert Gardner. Aiden Warner. Is Warner. that the name I'm Warner. looking for? Yeah. Aiden Warner it is not the person to steer that ship, right? This was so like, what do you do if you're a Florida decision maker? How do you judge Billy Napier against results without DJ Lagway or Graham Mertz? Yeah. Does it buy him time or does it give you an excuse? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it depends how you feel about Billy Napier. Right. I suppose, exactly. Within that administration. At one point when they brought in Aiden Warner, I turned to you and I said, what do we know about this guy? And he said, well, he's a Yale transfer. Right. And I said, High football IQ, yeah? Yeah. And he said he didn't play. He did not play it. Just a high regular IQ. Yeah. And to be honest with you, they had a go at this one, even late. But he threw a really bad pick on a drive where I think Florida needed to go down the field and try and tie this one up. Your final score was 34-20 to in favor of Georgia at the end of the day. Carson Beck threw multiple player interceptable passes. There were on multiple occasions he threw passes that could have been intercepted by multiple people. He the way I jotted it down on the note sheet yes. was his first two interceptions were underthrown into at least double coverage. Right. Truly, both were into at least double coverage. The third was a pick, I believe in the third quarter, early in the third yeah, he quarter. He got hit. Where he got hit and it was sort of tipped and it just was a wounded duck that Florida was able to jump up and grab. So, I give credit to Florida's defense for what they did in that game. Yeah. Um, you know, this was a much maligned unit coming into the season. They clearly took it seriously trying to reboot things, and it felt like they were getting pressure on Carson Beck. It felt like they were able to obviously change the game with turnovers, at least in the first half, with yeah. defensive backs being in the right place at the right time. Totally. Um, if nothing more, if you're a Florida fan, one of the things you take away from this is the fact that they look pretty good, I think, on defense against a – at a minimum, pretty good offense with Georgia, right? I mean, that is a sign yeah. that things are improving. I, yeah, but how much can you say, like, we improved in a losing injured effort? Like, it's just a hard sales job. And it's it not is. Billy Napier's fault. I don't think that both Graham Mertz and DJ Lagway are hurt. But I guess you could point to offensive line issues. I guess you – I don't know. It just seems like they're just a team with bad luck. They're a team with full-on bad luck. And I don't know how you judge – I. I can judge Georgia a little bit because Georgia seemed to be positioning themselves as an improving team, even after disappointing performances against you know teams like Kentucky, even Mississippi State, but then look strong to excellent against Texas, look all over the place, including terrible early against Alabama, that Florida was an opportunity as a double-digit, two-touchdown-plus favorite to say, okay, we've settled into this groove. There was This was a grooveless experience from Georgia football. And so yeah. – they're definitively decent, good, but not where they've been. Where do we rank Georgia? I don't know, man. They won their clunker, which we have to give them credit for. We had this debate on the car or in the car on the way over here. I think it's Oregon, Ohio State, one, two. Okay. Who's three? Do you put Georgia three to give them benefit of the doubt? You put Miami three. Miami has continued to win. They put up 50-some-odd points today, despite the fact they gave up 31 to Duke. Right. Um, and not just 31 to Duke. But they gave they went on like a, a tear of mediocrity in the middle of this game against Duke. But yes, they, they won and finished strong. You know, you get, you get to this point now where we start talking about rankings where it's like, where do we put Texas? If Tennessee is truly on the ropes, where, does we put, where do we put Tennessee? Mm-hmm. Um, suddenly a team like a BYU is one that um, thankfully was on by this week, but does BYU get a nod up there? 
Clemson is also another team that's on the ropes. I didn't even mention the ACC. We can talk about them in a little bit, but um, you, you know, some I think further kind of stratification, if you will, in the ACC as the Pitt SMU games going on right now. I'm confident saying at the point in time right now that we're recording this, SMU is going to win that game. They're up 28 points at halftime. Right. So I mean, we we are starting to get some of this intel. I think that we need to try and break these teams down. Meanwhile, Notre Dame also on by. Mm-hmm. probably stands to benefit more than anybody. Yes. It will not help them if A&M loses. Nonetheless, they are in the top 10. They're not going to be penalized for not playing a game. Right. And if there are teams in front of them where there are questions emerging about them or if, they, you know, frankly, they've got an easier schedule than those teams in front of them, they're going to find themselves in a position where they can just keep gradually moving up. I, look, you have to apply the same principles and standards to everybody even as schedules are wildly different. And that is, I don't know, take the three best teams each of these teams has played, which it varies dramatically. How did that team play in those games? And then you take road games against conference opponents. How did they look in those games? And if you are looking at any of these teams and saying they haven't played well on the road, they haven't played well against quality teams, but they're winning games, knock them down. Yeah. If they're... and. I like not style for the sake of style, but generally speaking, Notre Dame has won by a lot of points. Generally speaking, Indiana, who has not played a tough schedule at all, has won by a lot of points. They have performed like an excellent team should be like they have performed against their schedule better than BYU has performed against its schedule. And so that's something I I hold dearly in my chest. So (laughs) that's that's how you can more broadly apply the same standards. But. Yeah, how you play on the road, how you play against the best teams, the quote unquote best teams, which is also subjective. And I think that's why how you that, that's how at least initially you have to apply it. Does it matter until early December? It does not. No. But at least we can start shaping this a little bit. I mentioned the Big Twelve thing earlier. Yeah. As I often say, the Big Twelve is now also in a blender. Mm-hmm. Iowa State lost today. Oh, to be clear, Arizona is fully blended. The smoothie, I, the Arizona smoothie is ready for everybody to consume. Everybody can consume. UCF beat them into a pulp today. Oh, man. Just an absolute massacre. Mm-hmm. I don't have my soundboard. That would be a everybody got murdered sound right there. Uh, but Iowa State lost that game to Texas Tech. Taj Brooks. Taj Brooks will be a dude when we do our dude yes. alert segment on Tuesday. He runs it in on a direct snap, ran it around the right tackle into the end zone they end up winning 23 22 and in the k-state game houston of all teams scored 14 points in the fourth quarter to knock off k-state to give them their second conference loss at present who've he, been looking vulnerable by the way k-state against both kansas and colorado on the ropes the, the writing was on the wall yeah and frankly it was on the wall for iowa state as well absolutely all right so we have seen this coming we've kind of warned about it um, regardless of who we picked and when we picked them, it's if you've been paying attention, you have seen that some of these games have been closer than you'd expect. Mm-hmm. So where we stand right now in the Big 12 is actually quite interesting. Again, BYU stood, I think, to benefit the most from this week because they didn't play. They don't have anything to worry about. They've got Utah coming up in a rivalry game. I don't know how much we think of Utah, but I believe it's a road game. It's right. still a rivalry. Rivalries can get weird. So that's one to kind of take and put aside for another day. But... You've now got this combination of teams that are vying, I think, for that number two slot Mm -hmm. in the Big 12, one of which is still Iowa State, which only has one conference loss. Kansas State, Texas Tech, Cincinnati, Arizona State, who won big, TCU, like all of these are a bunch of teams that have two losses in the conference. Right. But sitting there also with one loss is a little old Colorado. Little old Colorado, right, because Nebraska's out of conference, right. Little old Colorado. And they don't own the tiebreaker against K-State, but otherwise are clean. Otherwise, I believe they stand to benefit a lot from just winning out. Oh, yeah. This was one of the circumstances that we talked through on our Tuesday episode. They needed Iowa State to lose. Check. And they need to win out. We'll see. TBD. Check number two. And then it would be helpful at this point in time if K-State beat Iowa State in the Farmageddon game, just to leave no doubt. Right. But- if all of those things occur, I, there's a pretty good chance that Colorado is getting into that Big 12 title game to play against BYU. But also, it's the Big 12. So as soon as you think a team is well-positioned, or as soon as you think a team is dead to rights, Houston, 
TCU, whoever. I came into this com- conference season thinking, yeah, Utah's probably in good shape. Arizona's going to be, you know, very difficult to deal with. Colorado's a wild card. And then Houston comes out and lays big old eggs. They're back. Yeah. They are the undead, right? Like Kansas looked pretty bad. Now they look at, at least Kansas looks dangerous, right? That they can put a lot of fear into a lot of teams. We'll see what happens. We'll see what that actually means. Utah's completely fallen off. Weird to say, but kind of not in terms of greatness or difficulties. ASU and Cincinnati have kind of just sort of like been what they've been. They've sort of chugged along. You know what they are. ASU six and two. Oklahoma State goes to this conference's championship game last year and remain winless in this conference thus far. So I guess you can count on Oklahoma State on some level this year. They've been consistently disappointing. Yeah. Well, and then there's also the case of Texas Tech. Yes. Texas Tech lost back-to-back games not so long ago to both Arizona and Baylor. The Baylor game was, you know. But also lost to Washington State. Opened up giving up 50 to Abilene Christian. Yeah. Two conference losses, three overall. And as it goes for them, the remainder of the season, they've got a game against Colorado, which could end up being rather significant. Agree. They've got a game on the road at Oklahoma State, which suddenly looks a lot more winnable. Mm -hmm. And they come back home to close things out against West Virginia, which also feels like a winnable game. Maybe not with West Virginia's proclivity to run the football. Where's that game? As long as West Virginia's away from Morgantown. it's, It's in Lubbock. Oh, okay. So, I mean, Texas Tech is another team that I don't think we could turn a blind eye to just because... Look, they went on the road and they beat Iowa State. That's a really good win. Yeah. They're just really tough to try and gauge and feel confident about week in and week out. But I think that almost applies at this point to every team in the Big 12. And then BYU from the rafters. <laughs> what a, BYU, Colorado, as we all predicted. Yeah. As, as we all predicted. And then I guess the other kind of angle this week is what's going on in the ACC. Mm-hmm. So at time of recording... Hopefully this won't be stale. Okay. What do we have? With about nine minutes left in the fourth quarter, though Clemson has the ball and is driving at about midfield in plus territory, Louisville currently leads 26-7. to seven. That's that, a lot to come back from. It's a lot to come back from for you and I talked about this earlier, what started as a pickleball effort well, from Cade Klubnik. Let's, let's cover our bases here. React to Clemson coming back and winning this game. Incredible win, should be a top 10 team, definitely cementing its spot as one of the top two teams in the ACC. They were down 26 to 7 with nine minutes left, and I don't want to bore you with the details of how they came back to win this game, but holy hell, how dramatic and impressive was that? Obviously a clunker of a performance the first three quarters plus, but this is what good teams do, Ty. They come back and they find ways to win. Okay, end scene. Now, (laughs) let's go through Louisville pulls this out cleanly. Louisville pulls this one out cleanly. First off, a great win for Louisville. Huge. To go on the road to Death Valley and win that game. Yeah, Tyler Shuck has not really won that big game and finally is able to sort of plant his flag. Had a beautiful rushing touchdown earlier in this game where he sort yeah. of dove and did the Superman somersault, which was pretty pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, Clemson losing this game gives them two losses on the season. Mm-hmm. Lost the game week one in resounding fashion against Georgia. Only one Georgia. in the ACC, yeah. This would be their first in the ACC, so they would still obviously be in it. But by virtue of Miami winning, by virtue of, I believe, SMU pulling away from Pitt, that would mean that SMU Mm -hmm. and Miami are on a collision course now for this ACC title game. The rest of the way for SMU is pretty clean by comparison. It is the easiest slate for the remainder of the season that I think you're going to find in the ACC. If you're an SMU fan, you got to feel pretty good about that. Okay. Um what this does is it paves the way for those two teams to meet, play right. for the ACC title game. Um, it opens up the possibility that SMU could find a way to win the ACC in its first year mm-hmm. in the conference, if not making the, into the playoff. I think it makes things really interesting with respect to these playoff rankings that they're going to release of all times on election on election day at night, Correct. right before the ballots close, yeah, yeah, yeah. which no one will pay attention to, I'm sure. But where they put a team like an SMU, maybe not the toughest schedule throughout the season, but at some point you got to take notice that they are playing really, really solid football. Well, that they beat Louisville, who possibly just beat Clemson. Yeah. Clemson. So, I mean, I think where I'm at with Clemson is they're going to need to get back to blowing teams out. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure they can do what they did in the first half of their schedule moving forward because, as we said on the preview episode, 
back half of the schedule gets harder right for Clemson not talking like they're playing Georgia every week but we're talking about playing top 20 caliber teams fringe top 20 teams Mm -hmm. a couple times over now throughout the month of November right close out the season against South Carolina South Carolina is probably on the verge of beating Texas A&M it's a good South Carolina team just as an example right not not a conference game not a conference game but that is more the case I think for the remainder of the season for the Clemson Tigers so it's for them to work their way back into kind of that national conversation um it's a different calculation than I think we saw in the beginning part of the year well they're on the the road that sometimes some of these big 12 teams in contention are which is they might not look great they might not be highly rated as a an at-large playoff team. Just win your conference, you get in as a top four seed, right? That's where Clemson is right now. And you neglected to went make to make another sort of mention with the ACC, and that is Miami is happily undefeated. Yeah. But they downloaded Hinge and they're swiping on some L's, right? Oh, yeah. They're searching for an L. They haven't really found that match yet, but between the Cal and Virginia Tech and Louisville and now Duke games, yep. they're on the prowl for a loss. By the way, Cam Ward had one of the worst interceptions we've ever seen. Yes, and some of the best plays, which is, I guess, the Cam Ward experience. It is the dichotomy that is Cam Ward. It is. He is so casual at times. Impressively so. Uh, Xavier Restrepo is casually excellent with regularity. Yep. Um, there's a lot to love about where this Miami team is in terms of scoring points pulling out games whatever Miami's got some work to clean up in terms of giving up the havoc plays like defenses are getting after them a little bit too much if I'm a Miami fan I'm a little bit concerned about the sacks and the tackles for loss that kind of thing Uh, a little bit concerned about Cam Ward just going ice cold for stretches yeah I'm a little bit concerned about a team like Duke not a great offense this is not a powerful high powered whatever offense they they rattled off like a 28 to 3 run i believe in the middle of this game miami gave up over 400 yards but forced four turnovers again it's like cam ward but on defense right they're swiping there there is a little bit of the good a little bit of the bad yes it's sort of the ink blot test you see what you want to see with miami they won 53 to 31 over duke to remain unbeaten on the season to remain unbeaten in conference why don't we wind this down here please i'm going to do some quick word association with you and we haven't even talked michigan oregon yet we haven't even talked michigan oregon we're going to start we're going to close things out with that game okay but just to make our way around college football here very quickly okay i'll give you a couple games and just give me your initial reaction sorry there's a an airbus flying overhead (laughs) right now as yvonne lendl closes out the third set syracuse 38 virginia tech 31 in overtime what do I think about? What do I know about this game? What are you, what's your reaction to that score? Awesome for Syracuse for coming back and pulling out a tough game after losing the way they did for uh, the way they did against Pitt. Um, tough Virginia Tech team, obviously. No starting quarterback. No starting running back. No starting quarterback. No starting running back. The game was in their grasp and they gacked it away. Yes, literally fell out of their hands. Yeah. And Cuse is now six and two and bowl eligible. So good for them. Yeah, you're one of the Franimal. Another reaction, give me your reaction to Minnesota 25, Illinois 17. It's about right. It feels right, doesn't it? Sort of about right. Max Brosmer wasn't accomplishing much downfield from what I could see in this game, which I was just sort of switching back and forth to. Um, But here's the thing. Yeah. Minnesota's won four straight. They've covered five straight, which is important for the purposes of of betting. Yeah. Uh, there were two fumbles in this game for Luke Altmaier, one of which was a very critical fumble. Ah. came inside the last minute as Illinois was driving in the red zone to potentially score the game-tying touchdown. So it was, it was. was. I'm not going to say it was there for Illinois, but there were opportunities there. Good for Minnesota. The Utah on. of the Big Ten, maybe? Indiana 47, Michigan State 10. Old Utah of the Big Ten. Um, Indiana's a, a war machine. They go down 10 nothing, 10-3, something like that, and they ripped off 47 straight. Uh, they're incredible. Curtis Rourke had a slow-ish start in the first drive or two, and then it was nothing but pain for Michigan State. They couldn't run the ball at all against Indiana. The offense gets all the attention, and maybe rightfully so on a certain level for Indiana. But defense has been pl- – again, these, is, these are not huge opponents. They have played a mediocre schedule at best, but they are doing to that mediocre schedule what an excellent team should be doing. They don't play single-digit games. No. This was nowhere near a game pretty quickly UCF 56 Arizona 12 man rest in peace you're down you're down on Zona 
I just it's a new way to lose in embarrassing fashion. And like I was one of those people after I think it was Northern Arizona week two where they're just, they're just not moving the ball. There's just so many mistakes. You're like, you know what? It's week two, working out the kinks. Maybe they didn't take this team seriously. I don't know. Something is off with this team. They've already made a change at play caller. The defense is a mess at times, as we saw today against what third string quarterback. Technically, this, this, this is the all time case of the backup being better than the starter, but it actually goes a level deeper. Right. Is the backup to the backup better than the starter? Because listen, yeah, that not only applies to the offense with quarterback. Right. Dylan Rizik missed five passes through for three ninety four and three touchdowns. Fire their defensive coordinator. Yeah. I believe new play caller on offense. Mm-hmm. Like they have changed a lot here midstream. RJ to, Harvey went off too, right? RJ Harvey had like 184 yards and yes. a bunch of touchdowns. He's great. So, I mean, th- this has been a a roller coaster ride if you're a UCF fan. Uh, a couple more here, and then we're going to close out with Oregon, Michigan. Okay. Ole Miss 63, Arkansas 31. There's always that team that doesn't actually play in the huge game or the huge games, but you kind of know belongs in that space and the best of Ole Miss is from what I can tell from afar as dangerous as most if not every team the problem is that's 83 percent of the time for Ole Miss it's not every week the the problem is the Penn State thing yeah it's the Penn State thing where you know the team's got talent mm-hmm. they're obviously very very good can they get to that next level this might be and we talked there's another thing we talked about in the car might be the best team that does not make the playoff right and it might not even be close. 63 to 31 against Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Arkansas is a plucky team. Jackson Dart, by the way, had a school record 515 passing yards, tied a school record with six touchdowns in this game. Ole Miss, on the whole, had 694 yards of offense against, against Arkansas. Against a totally decent Arkansas team. Against a totally decent Arkansas team. In Fayetteville, yes? In Fayetteville. Yeah. Oregon, Michigan. Um, okay. We were at this game. We sat in the press box for this game. 38 to 17 was your final. At one point, it seemed as if the point spread was not going to hit. No. A little bit of a backdoor cover for the Michigan Wolverines. Oregon had the ball late. They were down inside the five yard line. They decided they were going to score the touchdown. Totally unnecessary touchdown. They could have taken the knee with 25 seconds left. But yes. They did get it into the end zone so they win by 21 i didn't say this out loud because i didn't want to curse it or want it to happen or whatever a little bit of the like mario cristobal you can just kneel it and leave with a win in like a close it wasn't a close game but in kind of a weird ending of a game that oregon went pretty cold in the second half offensively or at least in the third quarter they took care of business 38 17 if we kind of forget the rhythms of this game is going to look better maybe even a lot better than 31 17 31 17 could have the you know the feel of kind of back and forth and oregon scores late 38 17 is like oh yeah i beat him by three touchdowns here's what i'll say about this game it felt like this one was going to be over at halftime yes 28 10 at halftime 28 10 at halftime oregon ripped off 21 in the second quarter okay after halftime michigan did a pretty good job bottling them up Oregon scored right before and got the ball back and right after. Yeah, yeah. They were set the to dominate the middle eight, but didn't. It felt as if that game was over, but the way that Michigan rebounded, specifically on defense, I thought was impressive. I also thought Davis Warren looked pretty good. I don't yeah. have I don't have his final stat line in front of me. I don't know if he is striking the fear of God into a good defense. But right. All things considered, given where they started and where I think they're at now. Davis Warren has definitely been a success story. He threw some nice throws in the red zone for touchdown passes. He did. He, he hit. Cole, he knows how to hit Colston Loveland. Uh, very much That so, might be yeah. the only thing he knows how to do in the passing game, yeah. but that definitely gives them a little bit of a flair on that offense that we have not seen before. Correct. What I do not get is why they continue to use Alex Orgy in the manner that they are because it is so telegraphed he's not going to throw the ball. There was that play in the fourth quarter on a big fourth down they're trying to get back in this thing. They need to score a touchdown. Instead of bringing Davis Warren in to try and throw another touchdown pass, which he had done very nicely right. earlier in the game, they bring in Alex Orgy. They try uh, a gadget play mm-hmm. where it's Samaj Morgan throwing to Alex Orgy. It's, yeah, it's a throwback. Yes, it was a pitch to Samaj Morgan, a backwards pass. Alex Orgy going out. Mateo Uyunglele staying with him, the defensive end, the edge rusher for Oregon. It not being it's there. Like if if you're going to bring the backup quarterback in, yeah, 
if you want to throw the ball, why, like, shouldn't the quarterback be the one throwing the ball? Sometimes it works, but in that moment, it just felt right. like it felt like an unnecessary. Well, there's risk. just no threat of a drop back situation on fourth and goal with Alex no. Orgy. There's I mean, no threat of that at so all. It's so telegraphed. And so I think if I'm a Michigan fan, that's what I'm most frustrated with. Mm-hmm. The quarterback thing was always going to be weird. Now you lose Jack Tuttle. That's unfortunate. Yes. These are the guys that you're rolling with now the rest of the year. You're rolling with Davis Warren. You're rolling with Alex Orgy. Mm-hmm. I think the balance they had a week ago was pretty good. Right. This week, I don't know if there was much of a balance at all because we knew what was going to happen every time Alex Orgy came in. He was going to run the football. He threw one ball away. He threw one away. Credit, yeah. He threw one away. He did have a nice run. He did, down the left sideline, yeah. But I was keeping track, and it's like one out of every seven times he gets the ball, you get like a decent size gain. And those don't seem like good odds, especially when you're in a high leverage moment. Late in the game, well, you need yeah. a touchdown to try and get back into the game. Well, and when you find yourself on second and eight, second and nine, second and 11, when he comes in on first down, and you're just behind the sticks with Alex Orgy more often than not. And it was, I, I don't think it makes a difference. Honestly, like the number of plays that Davis Warren was a- was able to make was impressive. It was basically to one guy between the 20s or you know, for the first 80 yards of the field in Colston Lovin, which was great. If you can make it work, that's great. Uh, found a couple guys in the end zone. Great. He was very good in short yardage goal line situations. This was not a team that, I mean, it's not a team that's built to separate itself from decent teams, let alone beat decent teams um, at this point in the season, given their quarterback situation. The rhythms for Oregon were impressive. Evan Stewart definitely dropped that touchdown pass. The Big Ten definitely should have reviewed it. The Big Ten kind of screwed Oregon over in that Ohio State game, kind of screwed Michigan over in this game. Probably made a difference in the Ohio State game. Probably would not have made the difference in this game. Um, Oregon ran strongly. They suffered, you know, their best receiver went down in Tez Johnson early on. I think he's going to be out for a long stretch of time. We'll see if that comes to bite Oregon on some level. He's Dylan Gabriel's safety blanket. Um but Oregon had a complete performance when it seemed like the pocket was breaking down. In, Dylan Gabriel. Yeah. In, in a complicated place to play. In a complicated place to play. Crowd was into this game. Was Michigan loud. was able to get some stops. It was loud. Dylan Gabriel was able to succeed downfield. In a year in college football where it feels like there is a lot of uncertainty abound. Right. This is the best team in college football. If nothing more, they're the most consistent right now. They're they're the Heinz Ward as Bain blows up the field in, Yeah. Dark is it Dark Knight? Dark, Dark Knight. Knight, yeah, yeah. No, Dark Knight rises. Rises, yes. Um, so, yeah, it's it's very nice that if Oregon is having longer stretches, be it against Indiana, be it against Michigan State, be it against Michigan today, as we record this, that they're winning this by three touchdowns. That they're yeah. winning not clunkers but semi stalled games by yeah. multiple scores. So look. Um, this is any, our, any other results you want to rattle through just like to, to tip your cap to anybody? Anything I mean, crazy? UAB our, won a game. UAB won a game. We could tip our cap to UCLA. Yeah. Uh, we, we will have more to discuss on that game as we get uh, a little bit deeper the into Tuesday the week. Show, yeah. CJ Bailey looked pretty good against Stanford. Yeah, absolutely. Um, had, a, had a nice day for NC State, only missed two throws. So kudos to him. Omari and Hampton had a huge day for North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want to dunk too much on Florida State, but just not a good performance for them. They gave up seven sacks and ten tackles for loss from a UNC defense that is, let's be honest, not the strongest It's pretty defense. below average. By the way, speaking of elite losers, what did Hugh Freeze do? Hugh Freeze lost to Vandy. And Diego Pavia again. Again, 17-7. Yeah. to seven. Um, And, you know, shout out ASU. Mentioned ASU before. Yeah. ASU winning 42-21. to 21. Sam Levitt, really nice game. Over Oklahoma State. So, look, we're almost out of battery juice oh, here. okay. I don't want to lose this audio. Um, again, thanks for bearing with us. We appreciate your patience. Um, we will be back on Tuesday with a more complete preview of the things that we did not discuss here as we have a chance to kind of sit and process all this information. Please make sure you hit follow. Please make sure you hit subscribe. Uh, apologies for the video being out late. Apologies <laughs> if the audio sounds a little bit different, but uh, we're kind of back to our roots. You're going to make sure it sounds good. Come back on. to our roots, just kind of going with the flow. Yeah, baby. Oh, uh, we got a plane? We got a plane? Maybe a little bit. We have a little bit of a plane coming in. For that guy over there, Dan Rubenstein, for myself, Ty Hildebrandt, as always, stay solid. Peace.